Good evening, everyone. So it's about that time. I think the bell's going to start ringing in a moment here. So uh, we're right at 630. So let's begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, continue to pour out your Holy Spirit upon each and every one of us and help us to grow in our understanding of our faith so that we might live that faith more completely and more fully. Uh, we continue tonight to study uh, your church, the church that you founded, your son founded uh, here on earth. And we pray that we might be strong, good members of that church, um, uh, witnessing to the, to the truth of Jesus Christ to all whom we meet. And Father, we thank you for your many blessings and graces in this, um, uh, in this colder weather. We pray for those who, are gonna, who suffer and struggle because of that, those who are uh, poor, those who are elderly, those who are sick. Um, and uh, we ask all things in Jesus' name, who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. Amen. And the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I was hoping by this time I would be uh, a little better and my voice would be in better shape, but it's not. Um, I'm finally breaking down and going to the doctor tomorrow, uh, and hopefully something good will come out of that. We'll be able to figure out what's going on. So, um, but, but just be patient with me, with my voice, um, and um, we'll try to do this as best we can. Now, last week we began talking about the church, all right? Again, what we're doing is we're going through the Nicene Creed. And as we go through, we talked about, I believe in God the Father Almighty, uh, I believe in Jesus Christ, and we, talk, we spent a few weeks looking at, at Jesus, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And so now we are in that section of the Nicene Creed where we say, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Last week we started talking about the church in some general ways with some uh, images of the church. The church is the body of Christ. The church is the, uh, the people of God. The church is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we looked at all of that. Tonight, today we're going to look at these four words that we say every Sunday. You know, uh, we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean when we say that? And so we're going to examine that. Um, and, um, you know, actually many other churches besides, it's kind of surprising, I think, that many other churches besides the Catholic Church also use the same Nicene Creed. And they say, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Now what we got to remember, if you uh, look at that, is that the Catholic in the Creed is a small c. It is not specifically referring to the Roman Catholic Church, all right? It is something else uh, that certainly includes the Roman Catholic Church, but other uh, denominations feel comfortable saying that because of the small c. All right, so let's get into this, all right? The, what are, um, we're, these, these four words are known as the four marks of the church. Now, the four marks of the church are not four people named Mark, all right? who are uh, important in the church. There are these four essential aspects and missions of the church. Then the church has claimed these from the very beginning, from the earliest days, that we are one holy Catholic and apostolic, that these really give us a definition of what it means. Now, when, as we go through, we're going to say, okay, well, the church is one, but there's many ways in which the church isn't one. All right? The church is holy, but we can certainly name a number of ways in which the church is not holy. All right? The church is Catholic or universal, but she is also particular and local. All right? And the church is apostolic. And I'll go through each one of these and talk about this. So the church is one. You know, if you go back to the Last Supper account in John's Gospel, uh, John's Gospel account of the, of the Last Supper is very different than that of the other three Gospels. Uh, in that, in the, John's Gospel, we have at the Last Supper, Jesus giving a very long prayer that is known as the, the, the high priestly prayer of Jesus. And the center point of that prayer is when Jesus prays and says, Father, may they be one as you and I are one. This was the central prayer of Jesus the night before he died, as he, you know, which, you know, Death clarifies the mind, all right? So as he is praying in this last few hours of his life, his greatest prayer is that the church would be one. Now, we're going to talk about how the church is one, but we also have to acknowledge that this we have failed him. We have failed him throughout history 
in being one. We have not done a very good job of that in many ways. In what way can we say that the church is one? Well, we are one because we have one Father. We have one Savior, Jesus Christ. We have one soul. The church has one soul, which is the Holy Spirit. Uh, We differ to some extent about the Bible. We as Catholics recognize seven books of the Bible that Protestants do not, right? But we essentially have one Bible, right, which is, are this, is the sacred and holy book of Christianity. We have one creed, as I said, this Nicene Creed. Not only we as Catholics, but many of the, of the, uh, the mainstream uh, Christian churches also subscribe to this same creed and the, and the definition of the beliefs that we have. So we are one because of all of these things. And uh, we are one because we are the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. And so we are one body for that. We are one people of God. One people of God. Even though we may be in different denominations and we may have different beliefs and and, uh, et cetera, we still are one people of God. And we are one temple of the Holy Spirit. So there is this unity, this unity to the church. Uh, We look at the Trinity... And we see in the Trinity, the Trinity is both one and three. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, right? So in the same way we talk about the church, the church is both one and diverse. And diversity is not a bad thing, all right? We're going to talk about disunity in a little while. Disunity is a bad thing, but diversity is not. So the church is both one and diverse, all right? How is she diverse? Well, within the Catholic Church, right, there is the Roman Catholic Church, the Western Church that you and I belong to, but there are also in union with the Catholic Church, there are, I think it's 23 smaller Eastern churches, such as the Maronite Church, the Syro Malabar Church in, uh, in India, and, and, a, and a number of others that um, they, they have a, their own liturgy. They have their own liturgy. They use their own languages in their, in their prayer, all right? Um, the, their liturgy is very similar to ours, but it is different. It is different. And so they are considered these separate rites, all right? R-I-T-E-S, they're separate rites. So the church is diverse in that way. Now, up until the late 1960s, all right, he, the Western church throughout the world prayed in virtually exactly the same way because we were praying in latin all right and so one of the things people would say is you could go anywhere in the world you could go to europe you could go to africa go to asia you go to south america and go to mass and the mass that you would be hearing would be exactly the same as the mass that you would be hearing back home all right uh with with a few exceptions i mean they certainly the homily would be in the in the local the vernacular language and and the readings and that sort of thing but the vast majority of the mass was completely the same now after 1968 that changed dramatically after the second vatican council called for the use of the vernacular for the local language now every sunday the mass is said by catholics throughout the world in probably hundreds of different languages and dialects, all right? But again, what we have is diversity, and that's okay. That's okay. And the church fathers at the Second Vatican Council recognized that there would be benefits to the local people if they could understand what was happening and, and participate more fully into the Mass than they were able to before. Now, those of us who are old enough to remember before the Council changed the Mass, all right, um, it wasn't like we were just sitting there completely having no idea what was going on. It was kind of the tradition when you made your first Holy Communion that somebody would give you what? A missile, a missile, all right? And the missile that we were given tended to be you would have the Latin on one side and you would have the English on the other. So you could participate, all right, by, by responding to the priest, all right. Uh, usually, that was done quietly. It was only the servers who was who were was res- who were responding uh, vocally. But we would, uh, but we could follow that 
and we, could, we, could, we knew what was going on. So it wasn't like we were all just in the dark, kind of staring up at this thing happening up here in Latin, and we had no idea, all right? How many of you remember that? How many of you are old enough to remember that? Okay. How many of you got a, got a missile um, on, your, on your first Holy Communion? Yes, that was, that was a tradition back then. That was a tradition. So, um, so we knew what was going on. So uh, even in that unity, in the diversity, the missiles throughout the world allowed people in every culture to be able to participate in the Latin Mass. Um, so again, we have various languages now. We have various cultures in which the Mass is celebrated. Um, uh, I remember when Pope John Paul II, early on in his papacy, and he went to Australia, and he had mass with the Aborig Aborigines in Australia. And it, must, it was a shock to all of us here in the West, and it must have been a shock to Pope John Paul II and others, all right, because the women, all right, or a number of the women, were topless, all right, which was the normal way in which they would dress. And so, you know, you talk about, you know, diversity, all right, that that's an entirely different way to celebrate liturgy than what, you know, we're, we're kind of appalled by that sort of a thing. And uh, so, but that was that, I remember, I remember that and just how people reacted to that. So the church is one, and yes, she is diverse, all right, and her diversity does not interfere with her unity. All right? But the church does also experience disunity. And disunity is not a good thing. It is something that is opposed to the will of Christ. And disunity, the source of all disunity within the church, ultimately is sin. Ultimately is sin. All right? So we may see, I mean, we may see within a single parish, we may see great disunity. All right. Uh, now we don't have a school here, but in many uh, parishes, there is a real conflict between the school parents and the CCD parents. How many of you have ever seen that going on in a parish? All right, where the C CCD parents usually feel like they're second-class citizens, and the, the school's getting everything, and we're getting this, we're getting the table scraps. All right, is all that we're getting. You know, we may it may be uh, again that uh, you have a parish where uh, there's a focus on, uh, on, any of you from St. Tim's in Union? All right, St. Tim in Union. Okay, I mean, they, what, what big change has gone on in St. Timothy in Union in the last few years? A school, they built a school, they built a school. And there were people who wanted a school, it's going very, very well, but there were also a lot of people in the parish that did not want a school. They didn't want to divert a lot of the money that was going into other programs uh, uh, into the school. So it caused disunity within the parish, all right? Uh, it may be a pastor, all right, uh, who may be, um, um, you know, there, there are pastors who are really good at splitting parishes, all right, who, uh, you know, th they get those who are really on their side, all right, and then there are those who are really against them. There are those few unique pastors who, what they're really good at is alienating everyone, all right, and so, um, and, but that still creates disunity within the parish. What do we do? What do we do? You have people leaving their, the parishes because of that. Uh, but all, everywhere you see this, there is sin, there is a lack of charity, very often between different groups, all right, different age groups. Um, uh, if, if, you know, we don't have um, too much of, a, of multicultural parishes here in the Diocese of Covington, but if we did, that might be another area in which we would see disunity uh, between liberal and conservative, all right? There can be disunity. Now, I don't see disunity here. I see diversity here, but if you go to our 930 Mass, and then you go to our 1130 Mass, all right? You are in two totally different worlds, all right? You are in two totally different cultures at that point. Um, and they don't really, except for rare moments, run into each other, 
all right? Our 930 Mass, all right, is our organ Mass, and it tends to be much more traditional. And then our 1130 Mass is our contemporary uh, uh, group. Now, everybody seems to get along here, all right? I, I'm not, I'm not, I know you who are in the groups and stuff can tell me whether or not there's a lot of conflict, but I'm not hearing a lot of conflict. People seem to be happy by the fact that we offer these two different liturgies at different times and say, okay, as long as I got what I'm looking for, all right, then I'm fine, all right? If we tried to say, okay, we're going to go to a traditional liturgy at the 1130, all right, um, I would be driven out on a rail, all right? That, and, um, and possibly the same thing if we were to say, okay, the 930, we're going to have a contemporary uh, group playing at the 930 from now on. I think I too would be driven out on a rail. So that won't be happening, all right? That won't be happening as long as I'm the pastor. I'm smart enough to know I'm not going to do that. But, uh, but that could lead to, uh, right now, it's d diversity, all right? Because everybody's getting what they want. If somehow th people don't get what they want, that's when, geez, I forgot my collar isn't buttoned. But um, that, you know, then that's when people begin to get upset, all right? Um, so um, where, where else does this disunity come from, all right? Sometimes it comes from rebelliousness against authority. You know, the, the first sin of our parents, of our first parents, Adam and Eve, was a rebellion against God, all right? God had given them instructions about what they were to do and not do. And then Satan said, hey, come over here. You don't want to listen to him, all right? And they didn't want to listen to him. They didn't want to listen to him. So they rebelled against the authority of God. All right? And really, every sin, as we've talked about, is a rebellion against the authority of God. Every time you and I sin, we say, God, I know what you want me to do, and I'm not going to do it. All right? I'm not going to do what you want me to do. I'm going to do what I think is, is best. All right? And so within the church, there are also, this is a source of disunity, where there is rebelliousness against authority. Now, we live in an era in which there's a lot of rebelliousness against authority, all right? I, I grew up in the 1960s, and we saw this, you know, we saw the, uh, the best and the brightest, all right, lead us into the war in Vietnam, and so which really damaged the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, confidence of people in the, in the United States government. And then we had the Watergate affair, all right? So we had all of that. I, in the last 20 years, or, or maybe even 30 years, we have seen a real failure of the leadership of the church, all right, in dealing with the sexual abuse crisis. So there's a lot of anger in a lot of people towards authority. We don't, you know, we used to be maybe we trusted authority. We trusted the government that when they told us something was true, we thought that was true. And when the church told us that something was true, well, then that must be true, all right? Do you do that anymore? Is that the way? No, we are all very suspicious. We are all very suspicious of authority. Well, that causes difficulty for unity, all right? And we have people who just have no respect, have no respect whatsoever for, uh, for authority figures, all right? And including and maybe especially the Pope. Right? So it's like there are those who were, uh, when Pope Benedict especially was, was Pope, and he tended to be um, more conservative, right? And those who were on the left often expressed um, a real contempt for him, all right? Even the way in which they would pronounce his name, all right? Ratzinger, Ratzinger, all right? He's a rat, he's a rat, all right? And so that was, and now we see how many people on the right, how many conservatives are viciously anti-Francis, all right? We see this all the time. And so, you know, there is this disrespect. Now, we're allowed to disagree with each other, and we're allowed to disagree with authority, all right? We're allowed to say, I don't think that what you're doing is the way we ought to be doing this, all right? But the disrespect, the contempt, uh, the rebelliousness there, right, creates disunity within the church. And when the church is, is not, it, then, it, then how can the church be one if she is dis, disunified, all right? Um, where have we seen this throughout history, all right? There are, are really, uh, well, uh, two major, uh, we're in the middle of another one, but uh, 
in 1054, I mentioned this last week, I think, 1054 AD, there was what was known as the Great Schism. Now, there was always tension between the Western Church and the Eastern Church. When Constantine became the emperor of the Roman Empire, all right, he at first was in Rome, and that's where he established, that's where he brought the church out of the catacombs, and he built the, uh, the churches there, like St. Peter's and St. John and, and the others. Uh, but when Constantine first came into Rome, Rome was no longer a great city. It was a city that had fallen into terrible disrepair. And so it was falling down. The walls were falling down, all right? It was a place where there was a lot of sickness, uh, 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 the, where the water was bad. And so uh, after he was there for a little while, a few years, he said, I'm going to go somewhere else. Now, see, there were already, there were two capitals to the Roman Empire, all right? There was the western capital, which was Rome, and then there was the eastern capital, which was known as Byzantium, all right? Uh, it's now known as Istanbul, all right? It's in, in Turkey. Um, what he did was he said, that's a great city, and that's where I want to be. So he took his government, and he moved it from Rome to the eastern capital of the Roman Empire, and then he renamed it. It was Byzantium, and in all of his humility, he renamed it Constantinople. All right, uh, it named it after himself, and then he began building that city up. So there was tension between Rome and Constantinople, and this was certainly true within the church as well. Um, the papacy remained in Rome. Papacy remained in Rome, but the Eastern Church was saying, "Wait a minute! The emperor is now in Constantinople. Shouldn't that be the center of the church?" And there was a lot of political wrangling back and forth, all right, and, um, um, and, and which led to other, there were, there were some uh, theological differences as well between the East and the West. And eventually in 1054 AD, there was a split, the Great Schism, when the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Pope in Rome, all right, excommunicated each other said, you are no longer part of the church. Now, that excommunication was not lifted until the 1960s when Pope Paul VI met with the then Patriarch of Constantinople, and they officially lifted that, all right? Now, we are not in union with the Eastern churches at this point, all right? Uh, there is a hope. See, 1054, we are coming up on the 1,000th anniversary of that great schism. And there is a lot of hope that there will be, by 1054, and maybe officially uh, recognized in that year, a healing of the breach between the East and the West. Pope Paul, uh, John Paul II was very, very concerned about this. He had been, being a, a, a Pope from uh, Eastern Europe, he had a lot of contact with the, uh, with the Eastern churches. And uh, certainly between Poland and Russia, Russia is, um, is uh, the largest of the, uh, of the, uh, of the Eastern churches. All right? So he had a great deal of con uh, contact there. And it was of his greatest desire was to reunite the East and the West. And, he, and one of the things he said, a famous statement of his, is that the church must learn to breathe with both lungs. All right? That separated, we are, we are only half of what we are supposed to be. All right? So that was the first great breach. We are in a process, a time in which there is dialogue and there is work at trying to um, uh, learn how to be with one another and to resolve some of the theological differences. All right, uh, we're not there yet. There are some, of, um, so but we hope we hope and pray that they will. Um, so that was in 1054. Then in the 16th century, now we have the Western Church. So the Eastern Church split off. Now we have the Western Church. Now there is another great division that is going to take place, and that is between the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches. This is the Protestant Reformation, beginning with Martin Luther. So that was in the 16th century. And so then that certainly continues. That certainly continues that split. Now, the church has sought, 
especially in the, in the 50 years or so since the Second Vatican Council, to try to reconcile, all right? Uh, it's not going to be easier. It will be easier to reconcile with the Eastern churches than it will be for the Catholics and Protestants to come together, all right? The Protestant churches as a whole have moved pretty far away from us as Catholics, and so it will be very difficult to resolve the theological issues. Um, but, um, but there still is hope there. And the effort, the effort to communicate, to learn how to, to come together and to pray together, to minister together, right, by perhaps, you know, Catholics and Protestants running a, 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 something like a parish kitchen or, or other kinds of ministries to the poor. You know, these are the ways in which the church is trying to come together. There is also, there is dialogue between these groups of theologians in order to try to resolve, you know, um, can we come to a mutually agreeable statement, all right? So um, the church has relationships with both the Orthodox and the Protestants, okay? So that's the church is one. Now the church is holy. What does that mean to say that the church is holy? Well, first of all, she is holy because of the Trinity, because she possesses the Trinity, because she is the people of God. She is, the, she is made up of the sons and the daughters of God, and we have this one Father, because the church is the body of Christ, because we have the Holy Spirit as the soul of the church. The church is holy. But also because of the instruments of salvation that have been given to us. And just primarily the sacraments. The sacraments, the seven sacraments. And we as Catholics recognize seven sacraments. All right, some Protestant churches recognize two, baptism and, and communion. And there are some who don't recognize. They recognize ceremonies, but they don't recognize them as sacraments, as, as avenues of grace, all right? But we say because we possess these great sacraments, that is part of the holiness of the church. We then look at the saints. You know, we just over this uh, beginning of this month, we're celebrating the communion of saints. And so we think about all of the saints who are in heaven. You know, those are, and we, and we recognize that they were part of us, all right, and that there are saints in the world today. There are holy men and women in the church today, and they make the church um, uh, holy, all right? Now, the church is holy, but she also fails to achieve holiness. The church is made up of both saints and sinners, all right? Now, which would you consider yourself? Are you one of the saints or are you one of the sinners? All right? Hopefully that you are one of the saints, or at least you're on your way, on your way, all right? Well, they say that every, um, um, every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. Is that, um, and so, uh, yes, uh, so hopefully we are somewhere on this journey, this journey of growing into saints. But every one of us, brings our own sinfulness into the church, right? Um, I have had from time to time, it's been a long time since anybody said this to me, but it used to be I would hear people who said, we know the church is just so full of hypocrites. And it's like, well, there's always room for one more. Come and join us, all right? You know, none of, we're, we're all, we all talk the talk better than we walk the walk, all right? So if that's your idea of a hypocrite, all right, yeah, that's us. We plead guilty to that, all right? We are the ones who, and so, and, and we would love to have you with us. We'd love to have you with us. If you go looking for a church, I'm, I'm going to find a church that's not full of sinners. Well, the moment you walk in the door, they got one, all right? Seriously. I mean, we got to recognize that, all right? We are, every church is going to be a, a church that is made up of sinners, all right? I use the image um, um, uh, in, at, uh, a couple of weeks ago with Mass and talking about, you know, the church, or maybe it was here, I don't remember, um, where I was talking about the church and I used the image of uh, Titanic, the movie Titanic, you know, and that those who are in the waters, the cold, freezing waters of the North Atlantic, those are all of the lost people in the world, all right? And then there, is the, there are the rowboats, the, the lifeboats that are coming through trying to rescue people and get them in and then take them to the ship where they can be, get health, you know, whatever health care and food and whatever else they need. Um, and so, you know, we all got pulled out of the waters, every one of us, every one of us. 
And every one of us continues to be sinful in some ways. Hopefully, we have been successful at abandoning the big stuff, right? But maybe we haven't, right? Maybe we're still struggling with some of the big stuff, right? But if we have, aren't struggling with the big stuff, we're all still struggling with some of the small stuff. All right? with, the, with the smaller sins, the, uh, the less egregious sins. All right? so, and, and every one of us brings that into the church. All right? So in any parish, any parish, that's who we are. That's who we are. All right? And so if you look at a parish and it looks a little dysfunctional, well, yeah, because you're here. All right? You and I, and we're all part of that, and so there's going to be uh, some of that. Now, it can get out of control, all right? It can become, you know, uh, parishes like families or cities or cultures, whatever, can become very toxic. And, uh, and if nobody is addressing that, then it, be, it can become a serious problem, all right? So, what is it that we are part of a holy church, but each one of us must strive for holiness ourselves. Try to be uh, more and more like Christ. The church is Catholic. Now, what does that word mean? Universal. The church means universal. All right, Catholic means universal. Uh, that it is, uh, and so why are we a universal church? Why are we a Catholic church? Because what was the great mission that Jesus gave in the commission? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All right? So we, are, we have a mission to the entire world. We are not a church that's for America or for Italy or, uh, or you know, we have the, uh, the Anglican church where, uh, which King Henry started. It was the Church of England, all right? Well, we don't believe in that stuff. We say, no, the church is not supposed to be for one country or one culture or one race. It is a church for everybody. It is a universal church, and we are sent to all the world to make disciples, all right? And so we have this church. I talk, and when I talked about the church as one, and I talked about the liturgy of the church, you know, that uh, the church is uh, uh, going back to before the Second Vatican Council, and if you, were, if you were going to Mass in some kind of a pygmy community in Africa, all right, and there were Catholics there, and a Catholic priest was saying Mass, you heard the same Mass as what we were doing here in the Diocese of Covington, all right? because we are, and, but we are Catholic, we are reaching out, but um, um, we are trying as a church that reaches out. Uh, this is, again, since the Second Vatican Council, we were learning to, to how to embrace the diversity in different places, all right? Now, again, one of the, um, um, uh, recently, the, uh, there has been what was called the Synod for, on the Amazon, all right, and there was a lot. There's been a lot of controversies come out of that. What was the point of the synod? Well, there's a lot of problems, all right, with the church in the Amazon. All right, that there are Catholics spread throughout the Amazon, and there is a radical shortage of clergy, where people would maybe once a year they would have a priest who would be able to come in and to, uh, to hear confessions and to say mass. And so one of the, th the questions that they were raising down there was about, uh, about priests and about uh, even um, ordaining married men, uh, those who are already deacons, so that they could go into those places and that the, the, uh, the sacraments would be made more available for, the, uh, for those there, all right? Now, that's not a problem, all right? That's not a problem in and of itself. The church had uh, both a celibate clergy and a married clergy uh, side by side for the first thousand years, all right? And then the Western church made the decision that she was going to ordain only uh, celibate clergy, all right? Now, in the last several years, we have seen a number of men come into the Catholic church from other denominations who were... Uh, ministers, especially from the Anglican Church, where they were uh, ordained as priests, right, uh, in another church, and the church, uh, and they were married. They came in. The church reordained them, right, and they are married clergy. They are married clergy. So you know, it's not like this hasn't happened and isn't happening, right. The question, though, is whether to expand that. Another thing that was going on with the um, Synod of the Amazon was a question about creating another. Right, 
within the church. You know, again, we have the Maronite rite, we have the Sir Malabar rite, et cetera, et cetera, which are in union with Rome, but they use their own languages, and their liturgy is somewhat different than the way in which we conduct our own. And so one of the recommendations, none, there were no decisions. The Synod had no authority to make any decisions. They only made recommendations to Pope Francis, and it will be Francis that will have to make a decision which of those recommendations he is going to uh, accept and, and have put into practice. And one of those was to have this Amazonian rite. All right? What they're trying to do is we have this Catholic church, this universal church, but it has to be lived in local areas, all right, and, and 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 there's a tension then between local church and the universal church. There's also, and I want to talk about this. I kind of got into some trouble at uh, the noon session with this. Um, uh, there's a saying that is very ancient and it is still taught. I've even heard Pope Francis use this, which is that there is no salvation outside of the church. No salvation outside of the church. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? We often get confused about things when we hear them, all right, and think these are saying something that they are not. Uh, does it mean that anyone who is not a practicing Catholic cannot be saved, all right? There are Catholics who would say that, all right? The church does not say that, all right? Does not say that. Does it mean that anyone who does not explicitly accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, whether as Catholics or Protestants or Orthodox or whatever, but anyone who does not explicitly accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior cannot be saved. Many, many, many of our Protestants would say yes, and there are many Catholics who would say yes, all right, if you do not believe. So that would mean that all the Jews, that all the Muslims, all Hindus, all right, um, all of the, uh, the people who lived before Christ came, all right, that all of them are going to hell. All right? Is that what the church teaches? Is that what the church teaches? No, it is not. No, it is not. The church teaches that, the, um, that there is no salvation outside of the church, but that there are ways of being part of the church which are not explicit but implicit. All right? We believe that the Catholic Church, and I get in trouble when I say this, but it's absolutely true, but we, this is what the Catholic Church believes. We believe that the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus founded and intended. When Jesus said at the, uh, and when he was addressing Peter, he says, Peter, you are rock, and on this rock I will build my church. We believe that the church that Jesus founded was and is the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, all right? And, um, and so um, um, we believe that the, church, the Catholic Church is the the one true church. Now, what do we believe about Protestants and about the Orthodox? All right? The Orthodox believe about 98% of the same things that we as Catholics do. All right? And they have all of the seven sacraments. All right? They believe in the Bible, the whole Bible that we believe in. And so we have no problem. We recognize them easily as part of us, as part of us. Even though there's disunity there, we recognize them. What about Protestants? All right? Well, most Protestants, if you had, if we drew the Catholic faith, put everything in this circle, and then we had a Protestant, um, the Protestant church, let's just say one, the Baptist, all right? And we drew a circle. Again, about 70 to 75 percent, there would be crossover there, all right? And so we believe that even in Protestant churches, there is sufficient truth and grace for people to be saved, all right? And that in, in so far as they are in union with us in terms of belief, relationship with God, et cetera, et cetera, all right, they are part of the Catholic Church, all right? You following me there? What about Jews? What about Muslims, all right? What about atheists, all right? What about people who don't believe in God or agnostics? Can they be saved? And the church would say yes. The church, and this came from the Second Vatican Council, the church said that anyone who through no fault of their own, that's an important part of it, through no fault of their own, have not come to know that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world and that the Catholic Church is the church that he founded. 
those who through no fault of their own, who have not come to know that, all right, but who have sought the truth with all sincerity, all right? And who is the truth? Jesus. Jesus is the truth, all right? I mean, I may be seeking the truth, but I, and, and I'm, that means I'm seeking Christ. I may not know that I'm seeking Christ, but that's the reality is that I am seeking Christ, all right? And so if they are seeking truth as best as they can, and if they are trying to live out their lives according to the truth as they have discovered it, all right, then we say they may be saved. We, can, we don't say they are saved. We don't know. We don't know who, who all is saved. We don't know who all is saved. But they may be saved. Now, are they saved by their own goodness and by their own search for the truth? No. They are also saved by Christ. As St. Peter tells us, there is one name given to human beings by which they may be saved, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. And so they are saved by him in an anonymous way. Does that make sense? You understand what I'm saying? All right. Now, again, there are many um, uh, who th think that we as Catholics are way off base with that. But that's what we believe. We still believe that there's no salvation outside the church. There is one church that Christ has given to the world. And so we, but there are ways of being part of the church without even knowing explicitly that's what I'm doing. Okay. Now, the final one is apostolic. The church is apostolic. That means that it is founded on the faith of the apostles. All right? None of us have ever met Jesus Christ. None of us have ever seen him work his miracles. None of us have ever heard him teach and preach. The apostles did. They are the eyewitnesses. Our faith is based on their faith all right our faith is based on their faith it is and so we have do we trust them that's the big question this is why many of us myself included were very offended and stood up during the whole debate concerning the da vinci code how many of you have read the da vinci code all right it is an attack on the apostles of the church and if we can't trust them we can't trust any of this because it all came to us from them, all right? And that book is arguing that Jesus did not create a church, that he did not instruct them to be in charge of the church, that this was a self-serving move on their, on their, on their um, uh, behalf, all right? If that's true, this is all a lie. Absolutely, absolutely. If we can't trust in the apostles when they said that Jesus rose from the dead, then this is, all, this is all pointless. So why? Why do we believe that they told us the truth? All right? There have been people throughout history who have said that they made this up. Well, here's why I believe it. All right? Imagine these 11 at this point because Judas is gone. All right? Well, Jesus is dead. And like, what are we going to do? Well, you know what? Why don't we come up with this idea that he rose from the dead and put us in charge of everything? And then we can build this church, all right? And we can become wealthy and famous and powerful, all right? So that's what they do. That's what they do. They decide they're going to found this church, all right? They're going to tell everybody that they saw Jesus raised from the dead, all right? Sorry he's gone. He was only here for 40 days. So you don't get a chance to see that, all right? <coughs> so that might be a good deal. That might be a good deal, all right? But here's, is that what happened? Is that what happened? Did they get rich? No, all right? Did they get powerful? No, they all died martyrs' deaths, every one of them. See, if you and I entered into a conspiracy, all right, and we're going to try to do something, we're all going to get wealthy and powerful, whatever, you know, and it all works out, we might actually be, pull this off. But let's just say that there's a few of us, all right, and they arrest Dave over here, and they execute him, all right? And then they arrest Cindy over here, and they execute her, all right? Which one of us is going to say, oh, wait a minute, we lied? <laughs> all right? You might die for the truth. You're not going to die for a lie. You're not going to die for a lie, all right? And they all died for that truth. Every one of them, with the exception of John, the beloved disciple, who spent time in prison on the island of Patmos, all right, um, all of them died a martyr's death, insisting, yes, he did rise from the dead, and that everything that we're telling you is true, all right? 
To me, that is absolutely convincing. That is absolutely convincing because nobody would do that for a lie. Nobody would do that for a lie. Or certainly all of them wouldn't have done it for a lie. All right? Somebody would have broken. All right? If I was in that group, I would have been one of the ones that broke. All right? I don't suffer well. All right? So anyway, it, we're, our faith is founded on the faith of the apostles. All right? So that means that ours is a received faith. We don't get to make this thing up as we go along. All right? We can't just simply change the church and say, well, you know, we'd like for it, we'd like to have it be this way. We'd like for, uh, uh, you know, we were, and that's going on a lot in the church today. This is one of the real conflicts in the church today. You know, the issue of same-sex relationships, all right? And I'm incredibly sympathetic to those who are same-sex oriented, all right? Um, I am not, any, I will not in any way, shape, or form condemn somebody because I know too many who are suffering greatly because of that. But many of them would like for us to change the church's teaching, all right, so that uh, same-sex couples could get married. Well, how do we do that? How do we do that and be faithful to the apostolic origins of the church, all right? We must love them, all right? We must reach out to them. We must support them, all right? But we can't say, okay, because we want to, we're going to change this. The same thing, this is where we got into it today with uh, somebody got very upset when the issue of uh, ordaining women, all right? The church says, we don't have the authority to change that, all right? That that's doctrine, that's dogma. This is something that we have received from the beginning. And so we don't have the, I mean, if we could, I would be one of the first ones to advocate it, all right? I would be one of the first ones to advocate for the ordination of women if I believed that the church had the authority to make that change. It doesn't. It doesn't. And we can't just change it because we want to, all right? Because this is, because it's no longer politically um, um, comfortable, all right? We can't do that. We can't do that because we are an apostolic church. We are an apostolic church, all right? So I'm going to stop there. What time is it? Okay. Yes. With what now? Of, okay. Okay, the ordination of, of women to the priesthood, all right? There is a, there, okay, he's asking what about the ordination of, of women to the diaconate? And that is a, an issue that is being studied. Pope Francis had asked a group to study it, all right? And they came back with very inconclusive responses because there seems to have been women in the early church who were referred to as deacons. But, but the question is, were they deacons as we understand deacons? Is it, what is exactly is going on? And so the Synod on the Amazon, all right, asked that that question be opened again, all right? And to see, you know, could women be ordained to the, uh, the diaconate, all right? So that's an open question at this point. Okay, a lot, why, why um, there are people who believe that if we open the uh, diaconate to women, all right, that that's one foot inside the door, all right, uh, or that slippery slope, you know, that we sometimes hear about. Um, and, and, um, and I think there's some truth to that, that if, if there is an ordination of women to the diaconate, a lot of people are going to start calling for the ordination of women to the priesthood, all right? Um, I don't think that's a good reason not to ordain women if it is theologically possible to do so, all right? You may have to say, okay, listen, this is, and, and there is a difference in the ordination of deacons, all right? In terms of what a deacon can do, any layperson can do, can be delegated to do, all right? Uh, it, uh, a deacon can um, proclaim the gospel and preach. That's not normally something for lay people, but a lay person can be delegated by a bishop to do those things. A lay person can be delegated to, uh, to have pastoral responsibility for a parish, all right? Um, a, 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 lay, a lay person is, uh, can perform marriages if they are delegated by the bishop to do that, all right? And so uh, there is nothing that a deacon can do that a layperson can't be delegated to do, 
right? But there are certain things that a priest can do that even a deacon cannot do and a layperson can do. They cannot say mass and confect the Eucharist. They cannot hear confessions and give absolution. So there are, so there are those who question whether or not the ordination to the diaconate because of that could be open to women. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So with the Eastern um, Church, have they had something similar to the Protestant Reformation? They have had divisions, all right? There are, there are many Eastern churches, all right? Uh, some of them remain in good relationship with one another. Others have fallen out of that and have excommunicated each other. I mean, they love to excommunicate people, you know. And so, uh, so yes, there are, you know, there have been that. But but there is, no, but they they still remain orthodox in their theology. There has not been like within the within the Western Church a break like the Protestant Reformation where there was a radical change of theology, a radical rejection of sacraments uh, and many other things that are, that are part of the Catholic Church. So no, they have not had that. So they have had their own versions of disunity, right? Okay, um, the, I, I'm going to repeat it, okay. The idea of, of same-sex marriage, all right, and the idea of the ordination of women runs up against the apostolic origins of the church, all right? The church sees no authority that she has to make changes in those matters, all right? The ordination of men is not a dogma. Or the ordination of married men versus celibate men is not a dogma. It is a, it is a discipline of the church. All right? We have had, for the first thousand years of the church, celibate clergy and married clergy coexisted. All right? It was in the early part of the second millennium that the church, and, and, and at that point, uh, it had become mostly a celibate clergy anyway. All right? But it was in the early part of the, of the second millennium that the church made the decision, okay, from now on what we plan to do is only ordain uh, celibate clergy. All right? The church made that decision. All right? She can undo that decision. It's a, it's a discipline. It's not a dogma. All right? What we can't change is dogma. All right? What's been handed down to us from the beginning. So, this is, so we know that, yes, we can. In fact, we're, we've done it. All right? In the last few years, we've, we've, we've ordained a number of married men who came to us uh, as ministers from another religion, from the Anglican Communion, from Lutheranism, and a number of others. Uh, so we have done that. We have done that. Uh, so we know that we can do that. When the, uh, when the uh, Synod of, uh, on the Amazon asked for that, they were asking for an expansion of something that was already happening in the church. All right. So yes, we can change that. We can change. But again, the, the church just sees that she has no authority. Um, it, again, this is dogma to change the ordination of women. And then it would be, um, you know, how do we change the teaching on same-sex marriage given the biblical statements on homosexuality? All right. Now, again, where I think what we have to be very careful of is that we do not condemn, we do not denounce, you know, we must be incredibly compassionate because it's very painful to, for them, to, for somebody, for a, a same-sex couple to hear that they, their marriage cannot be recognized by the church. So that there are also heterosexual couples who, because of a previous marriage, 
that cannot be annulled. All right? I have a sister who her husband has gone through an annulment process all the way to Rome and is not able to get, um, uh, he is not going to be able to get an annulment. And so because of that, their, their marriage, all right, which is a beautiful marriage, is never going to be recognized officially by the church. That's extremely painful for them. And so, you know, it's hard. It's very, very hard. And I, and I will not minimize that in any way. And so what we have to do is help people who have these very painful and difficult realities in their lives to help them to carry the crosses that they have to carry. All right? Okay. We will not meet next week. Next week I have uh, the Sarah Club has their annual uh, priest appreciation dinner. The following Thursday we will not meet because that's Thanksgiving. And then we will be back for two Thursdays, all right? We will talk about our eternal destiny, that's the end of the world and, um, and heaven, hell, and all of that good stuff. And then the final week uh, is uh, we'll be talking about Mary. So, okay? The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Okay.